Good morning, everybody. It's the top of the hour, so welcome to today's Early Learning with Families 2.0 webinar hosted by InfoPeople. InfoPeople is dedicated to bringing you the best in practical library training and improving information access for the public by improving the skills of library workers. InfoPeople is supported in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of the Library Services and Technology Act administered in California by the State Librarian. Today's webinar is entitled Foundations of Early Childhood Development. It's all about relationships. Presented by Dr. John Hornstein of Brazelton Touchpoint Center and Rivka Sass. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rivka. Well, thank you, Eileen. Hi, everyone. And I won't even say good morning or good afternoon because we truly are a global group today. I'm Rivka Sass, and I'm the director of the Sacramento Public Library here in beautiful Sacramento, where it's about 80 degrees today. <laughs> And um, I am absolutely delighted to be the one to just introduce um, John and this topic because as a longtime children's librarian and now a library director, I really believe that early learning matters and early and understanding child development is critically important to librarians because we're the people who are most likely to help parents in their role as their children's first teachers. So understanding where a child is from the point of view of development will help us help parents and caregivers during that critical time when children are learning to learn and the world is an open book for them, no pun intended. When library staff form relationships with young children and their families, we have a chance to do three things. First, we can provide background information on why it's important to talk, sing, read, write, and play those five critical skills that we are all invested in helping every child start school ready to, to learn with. We can, secondly, provide the resources to do those things. It's in a safe environment, a non-judgmental environment, and of course, at no cost. And then third, we provide a trusted ally to boost parental confidence and help parents make reading enjoyable. Those of you who, uh, who are children's librarians know that you're often put in the position of answering questions that we were not prepared for when we all went to library school around, why is, why is he doing this now? Those kinds of things. So you, you do become a trusted resource that, uh, that parents really value. Parents and, and other caregivers uh, need to make their homes a great place for children to get ready to learn. And that really is, is why I wanted to be able to talk today. Because it doesn't take money for that to happen. It takes a regular visit to the library. It takes the opportunity to check out those materials, the music, the books, and to participate in those activities that foster development along the way and that help children explore learning informally. And we know that children who start kindergarten ready to learn are going to be more successful in school. They're going to probably read better, at least at grade level or above, by the end of second grade. And we know that those children are more likely to read at grade level at fourth grade and have a better chance of graduating from high school. So all of that developmental stuff is absolutely critical. And a librarian who can guide parents through the ages and stages of, of early development as I said, becomes that trusted and beloved resource. It is about relationships. One of the things that we, especially those of us who are library administrators, uh, need to do to support our staff in, de in delivering developmentally appropriate early learning programs and services is, first of all, to show that commitment that we believe in it and value it. As a library director, I have the responsibility to provide the resources, the training, the support that our librarians need and we all need to work together sharing that expertise and those resources and telling our story outside of libraries about why what we do is important. We're so, in, we're so fortunate today to have Dr. John Hornstein with us for this webinar. He's going to provide some of the foundational concepts that inform early childhood development and parental involvement in helping children prepare for a lifetime of curiosity, creativity, and learning. So it's an honor for me to tell you just a little bit about him. Uh, Doc, Dr. Horstein is a research fellow, uh, Harvard Medical School, and is one of the founding faculty members of the Brazelton Touchpoints Center. And those of us who are older parents certainly remember Dr. Brazelton's wonderful books that helped us get through 
those ages and stages of, of early childhood. His work at BTC has included translating the core concepts behind Dr. Brazelton's touch points model of development into effective professional development programs for providers across the service delivery spectrum. His interest in emotional health in, health in early childhood led him to join the staff of the Muskie Institute at the University of Southern Maine, and he, where he directed the Attachment Interaction Mastery and Social Support Project that developed a system of assessment and practice, as well as promoted local and state systems to change support uh, to change how they support emotional health of young children and families. He has a master's degree from the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study at Tufts and a doctorate from Harvard University in Human Development and Psychology, where his dissertation incorporated his professional experiences and observations on the emotional health among young children with special needs and as well as typically developing children. He's been on the faculty at the University of New Hampshire School of Education, and he continues as a program evaluator at the University of New Hampshire Department of Education Master's Program for Early Childhood Educators and serves on doctoral dissertation committees. His academic interests and publications include work on creativity for early childhood classroom teachers, cross-cultural child study, and program evaluation. Welcome, Dr. Hornstein. Wow, thank you. I guess you'd have to be pulled to have done all those things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, it's, I, I don't know that I've ever uh, heard that much. Um, anyway, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a project that, um, that just is, is so wonderful in our touch points trainings over the years. We've had a few librarians and they've always been really wonderful uh, contributors to the, to the, the training process. Um, what I'd like to do today is, is to talk a little bit about our view of child development, hopefully informing the participants, all of you, on how, how you might use that information in uh, supporting families. I loved what Rivka said about, well, first of all, just thinking about learning as learning to learn. Um, I actually taught a course at the University of New Hampshire called that. Um, and I think it, it very much is a kind of a process in which children are acculturated to the process of learning. And then um, the, the idea that somehow we're often in a position with families of, of, of being asked questions that we may not know the answers to. And part of what I'm going to talk about in relation to the process of child, child development is that it does take um, a system of people around children and that it's not always necessary to answer the question. Uh, it's, it may be more important just to be there with the parent. Um, so I'm going to start right away because I have a lot to, to get through here. Um, and so I'm going to proceed to the first slide. I'm going to click that. Yes. So I thought since um, everybody here is interested in reading um, that I would read something. Uh, this is from a book by Marianne Wolf. Uh, hopefully some of you know her work. Uh, she's at Tufts. Um, and uh, the book is Proust and the Squid, the Story and Science of the Reading Brain. And she does a marvelous job of, of looking at how uh, children learn to read and the complexity of that process. A small child sits in rapt attention on the lap of a beloved adult, listening to words that move like water, words that tell of fairies, dragons, and giants in faraway places never before imagined. The young child's brain prepares to read far earlier than one might ever suspect. Yes, the young child's brain prepares to read far earlier than one might ever suspect. In fact, parts of the brain are already working on it before the child is even born and makes use of almost all the raw material of early childhood, every perception, concept, and word. It does so by learning to use all the important structures that will make up the brain's universal reading system. 
and there are multiple of those structures in the brain. But under the crook of an arm in the comfort of a loved one's lap. And this last, that last line is so important because the brain matures in the context of relationships. We hear so much about babies' brains and protecting babies' brains, but I think often what's, what's forgotten in that, in that conversation is, is, is thinking about the, the very um, fundamental interactions that allow that process to take place and the variety of ways in which that can take place. So from the Touchpoints perspective, from what we do at Touchpoints, and we work throughout the country and internationally in supporting uh, uh, healthy child development, optimal child development, healthy functional families, competent and healthy professionals, and strong communities. And I list these goals in part to, to point out that it is not just that we're thinking about child development here. We're thinking about the systems in which children develop and that the brain is designed to utilize in order to grow in a healthy way. So from the perspective of libraries, yes, you support uh, child development when families bring their children in um, and you support the families, but you support each other. And um, this system of services that you're building that supports families is, is quite important. So some of what I have to say or some of what's part of this approach applies at the systems level as well as at the child or family level. Um, so uh, next. So the key points I want to talk about are child development and our view and um, Rivka, I think, mentioned Dr. Brazelton's uh, early work in which uh, he was on television a lot. He had his own TV show. Uh, in fact, if you go to his house, the first thing he shows you is his Emmy. Um, he's very proud of that work because he reached many parents. Um, but but this this the 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 approach developed by Dr. Brazelton is is a, a unique approach in that it acknowledges the complexity of forces in a developing child's life. That development isn't easy to understand uh, when, you, when you get to the science of it. You've got the brain, you've got the, the family, you've got the culture, you've got the unique um, behavior of the child, and you have all of that interacting together at the same time. And what I think Dr. Brazelton did in his his work, and in particular in the Touchpoints work, is to take this very complex process and make it very understandable to all of us. So some of the key points are that child development takes place within relationships. And that's what we're going to focus on the most, is, is, is how do we support those relationships? What occurs in those relationships that allows us an entry into the system? Uh, child development is characterized by predictable periods of disorganization. Things seem to be going along smoothly, and then things kind of fall apart or change. Um, and then emotions, the emotional connection between people is central to the process of development. The other major point is that w this process of supporting a child's development takes place within a society and a culture. In fact, a, there are plenty of people that would say in the field that um, that the brain requires that, that the brain, the baby's brain requires culture in order to become competent. So first of all, development takes place within relationships. And forgive me for showing you a photograph of myself and my daughter. Um, it's not easy. Uh, it's, it's so these relationships that we're trying to support should be mutually satisfying and culturally appropriate. And that's a real challenge. And I'm sure you're, you, 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 well, we're, we're all over the world, so um, wherever you are, um, you know that there are multiple cultural influences on families and that, that families actually get mixed messages. There's a lot, a lot of stresses on families today, which is why we are, we're talking today in part, and that there are very different messages about how to, to raise children. Um, even if you have a partner of, from the same town, the same culture as you, that partner probably has different ideas about how to raise the child. 
So, so this idea that that somehow the 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 child rearing package requires uh, coherent voices is 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 quite important, and that's that's where I want to end up today. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about supporting parental mastery and how we from the outside can support the relationship. So what's a touch point? Touch points are predictable periods of disorganization in a child's development. that can disrupt family relationships, but can also provide an opportunity for providers to connect with parents. And I'll give an example in a minute, but touch points is a basic idea and uh, that, that Dr. Brasselton talks about. So this idea that development is not smooth, that we go through periods, relatively smooth periods, and then something happens in development, in a child's brain, in, in uh, the expectations of society, and this organization takes place, and we have to reorganize. That's the basic idea behind touch points. But they also are opportunities to join the system. Um, and you might think, uh, as the example I thought of when I was looking at this bef uh, about an hour ago was, adolescent mind. Um, I happen to be living in the house with an adolescent, so that's coming up a lot. The adolescent mind, or what appears to be the adolescent mind. And this this early adolescent, which is, is very much of a brain phenomenon, the, the capacity to think abstractly, to, to all of a sudden get uh, kind of the meaning of metaphors. Um, or to have that strong interest in science fiction. Um, th this capacity that is very much uh, something that is sparked by brain development. Yet the disorganization comes from, okay, I can imagine the world as an adolescent. I can imagine things that aren't real. I can also imagine a world that's very different than the world that my parents have set up for me. And so there's disorganization that comes with that. Um, it's kind of a crude example, but it's, 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 it's what we're talking about. So let's move down earlier in life to, to seven months of age. Ever since, this is a parent of a seven month old, ever since he was six weeks old, he would sleep all night. Now this last week, he's standing up in the crib. Before, if he fussed a little bit, you could go in and give him a pacifier and he'd go back to sleep. Occasionally he would do that. Now he's wide awake, standing up, three o'clock in the morning and he's ready to play. If I lay him down, he pa pa pops back up again. You let him play a few minutes and he goes back to bed. For the last six months, he's been sleepy and now he's not. We were really spoiled. I don't know what to do. Okay, this is, this is a, a classic example of one of these predictable points in development. He's, this child is seven months old. He's been beginning to get mobile. He can stand on his feet. And it, he does not have a sense of what that clock in the, on the wall has, has to do with his life. He wants to practice. He wants to practice moving. He also, developmentally, his brain has changed so that he can keep the idea of his parents in his mind. He, he knows they're out there. So he can also practice getting their attention. He loves to see them. At three o'clock in the morning, but now at seven, not at six months necessarily or at five, but now at seven, he knows that he can do this. Not knows in in a in a totally cognitive self, but in a sense, but in a in a behavioral sense. So there's a number of things going on in this baby's brain that causes a baby to change, and now the parent says, "I don't know what to do." And this for a pediatrician, for example, or an early childhood educator is an opportunity to join the system and say, well, you know, what have you tried before? And isn't it interesting how he's changing? The, 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 the danger here is that the parent may distance herself. I, I'm tired. I have to go to work tomorrow. Uh, this child is getting to me. Um, and the, the relationship could be what we call derailed a little bit. Um, that the parent could show anger. Um, uh, and, and, and that kind of, it could be disruptive to, to, to development. Or 
um, this parent could be joined and 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 we could talk about this is what happens at seven to nine months. So these regressions in a child's behavior cause disorganization for parents. Um, that that and the, these predictable points, whether it's four months and the child is turning away from feeding, it's seven months when the child is, let's say, not sleeping, uh, toddlerhood when the child is having a tantrum, these, these regressions are like confusing to parents. And this is, uh, so what we talk about with the touch points approach is in part um, how we join with the inner life of the parent in relation to this disorganization. Um, so let's look at the first year. What are the goals of the first year of life? This is via touch points. Well, first of all, it's state regulation. So when the child is first born, they're challenged with uh, sleep and wake cycles and fussiness and alert. And so one of the goals that we have for children and child, child rearing packages have for children is to help children gain some sense of how to regulate themselves in, in relation to this, this somewhat confusing world. Another goal is attachment to the caregiver. Um, and uh, you probably know a lot about that already, but this sense of there's somebody here taking care of me, somebody I trust, somebody that can can be the consultant to the world for me. Then there's this, uh, over the first years, this increasing sense of self. I am somebody that can do something, and that relates to causality and object permanence. Um, so you can imagine, uh, a parent with a child coming to see you in your presence and dealing with these uh, these goals of the first year. So this is a take that is not necessarily touch points, but I think is relevant. Um, and that's that from birth, the world of children is organized by scripts that reflect familial and cultural child rearing patterns. That is that this child, this baby who's being given a bath right now, um, that brain inside his head, uh, actually his whole nervous system, well, he knows he's getting a bath. He knows that there's this woman there that's, that's bathing him. He probably implicitly knows that the woman is his mother. And he's experiencing something together with her at a very young age. And he experiences this over and over and over again. In fact, there's some research that shows that mothers, when they approach a child at this very young age, generally approach in pretty much the same way. Um, and the child's heart rate slows down, the child relaxes, the ch child starts attending in a calm way. Um, there's other research that, sh or actually the same research, but that shows that when fathers approach a child at some of these early ages, that the father tends to approach from a different direction each time. The child's heart rate goes up and the child says it's time to party. So, of course, uh, some mothers are more like fathers in this respect and some fathers more like mothers. Uh, the, the point is that the child and the child's brain is looking for patterns. The child is remembering something. The child is encoding uh, a script. And I'm sure all of you have read books to four-year-olds. And maybe if you're librarians, you don't skip pages. But when my daughter was four, I would occasionally try to skip a page. And she would be outraged if I tried to skip a page because she had the script of that book in her head. Well. In, in, in relation to development of self, in relation to emotional development and, um, and becoming a healthy cultural human being, these scripts are essential to what's going on in child development. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit on you. I'm going to three weeks. A mother at three weeks, and hopefully you see mothers at three weeks. I was expecting to have this six-month infant that was going to look and play and interact, and I get this little lump that sucks the life right out of me every hour on the hour. Hmm. 
That's a powerful statement, isn't it? This is what the mother, many mothers of three weeks old, three week olds experience. And what's beautiful about this is that she actually says it, um, which means that that we can listen and we can say, yes, it, this is difficult, isn't it? Um, I think what this, this quote tells me is that the, this job is, is a difficult job, but also by putting words to this, that there's another that can listen to this, that can say, yes, this is a hard job and you're not alone. Now I'm going to jump to nine months. Uh, as you could tell by the earlier quote, I love this age period from seven to nine months. Travel broadens the mind. At nine months, we see the development of later infancy. Um, we see that the child can, can begin moving. The whole world changes for both the child and the parent. And it's actually disorganizing for both. The child, before the child starts referencing the parent to see how to behave. So social referencing is when the, the baby looks to the child, I mean, looks to the parent and then regulates his or her behavior in relation to the facial expression of the, of, of the adult. Um, before that happens, the child learns to crawl typically. In fact, it's about a month before, uh, before the child de demonstrates a fear of height. Well, why is that? Does that have something to do with engaging an adult in the care of the child? Does that have something to do with attachment? That I can move and crawl, but I don't have a fear of heights, but I've also developed this capacity to look at her face, to hear her voice, so that I can regulate my behavior. This is profoundly important. But it's also a profound change for the parent. So the child is experiencing this brain change that allows it to be mobile, her, to be mobile, allows it to seek other people's opinion through facial expression. Um, but the parent is also disorganized because, because the change is, oh, now this child is reading my mind. Now I have to be a different parent. And I will show you a quote about that. Part of what's happening at this age, and this is such a privileged time for learning. So I love this picture. The mother and the child are looking at toys together. And the mother is very intentionally regulating what she's doing based on what the child is doing. She, the child is actually, I, well, it looks like the mother is holding one of the blocks and the child is holding the other block but 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 what they're doing is they're both pretty much looking at the same thing and what's important here is they both know it they both know that the other one is intensely involved and this is such a this is this child actually looks younger than nine months to me and i'm judging just by the child's posture a little bit and and the what is so beautiful about this is this is exactly what the child needs to do in order to succeed in school. Think about first grade, second grade, or um, in graduate school. You need to be able to pay attention to the same thing that the teacher is paying attention to. Um, there's a script being developed here. There's a capacity, developmental capacity that's being developed here that is essential for learning. And it's it's beautiful. Um, this and this dance, this this dance of looking at the same thing looks quite different among different families and different societies. But the the idea of joint attention is is essential everywhere. Um, if you know if in a, in a subsistence society where you're being carried on your 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 mother's back as she's working you are there with her she's attending to you but you're paying attention to the same thing 
So here's a quote from the parent of a nine month old. It's exciting to see him do all of these new things, but I'll have to adjust to the changes. Before where he really couldn't move, I, or where he couldn't really move, I had an advantage because I get a lot of things done. But now that he can move, I'm constantly running after him, trying to do what I got to do too. So here's the touch point. Here's the disorganization. The child now is doing new things. And, and what, what this mother acknowledges is the excitement part of it, not just the challenge part of it. Um, when you get too obsessed with the challenge part of it, it derails the relationship. And uh, then we uh, need to intervene. So let's move to toddlerhood, the most exciting time of a person's life. The sense of new sense of self. So toddler between one and three years of age, the sense of self, the sense that I can do things on my own. And when I start reaching out and do things on my own, I start getting afraid that I'm too far out there. And so I become clingy. You see the touch point in what I'm saying? This child at one has a sense of self, has a sense that they actually have an effect on the world. I can stack something, I can do things, I can play with something and do these little experiments and see what happens when I knock something over um, or when I find something. But then I'm starting to explore with this little scientist script inside of my head and all of a sudden I turn around and my mummy's not there. Um, so I, I, I go back and I get clingy and we see this in the 15 month old that the child is starting to get clingy. Along with this in this period is this wonderful uh, capacity to think internally, to take ideas and represent them in one's head. So we have in toddlerhood, we have this phenomenon called deferred imitation where the child may see things one day, uh, perhaps in childcare, but act it out another day at home and the parents going like where did that come from i've never seen the child do that it's an exciting developmental phenomenon that the child can hold these things in his or her head but it's disorganizing to the parent because it surprises them when they act on it uh, this sense of self-control and mastery and this is a continuing theme from from early infancy so I mentioned uh, even with the newborn we're dealing with sleep wake cycles we're dealing with fussiness we're trying to co-regulate with the child so that they can master their their sleep cycle so that they can calm themselves down when they're fussy well in toddlerhood we have this the, the 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 kind of higher level challenges of I have ideas that I have to control as well and we'll see some examples of that I mentioned the separation and exploration and the idea that there are rules I need to follow um, this capacity is just wonderful capacity that emerges in toddlerhood of of knowing that um, the world has standards it comes with representational thought oh I I want to write a book about uh-oh, the uh-oh phase, when, you know, 16 to 18 month old children start using the term uh-oh, when something violates um, what, they, uh, what they see as the way, that, that pattern, that script that they know to be true. Um, and then we have peer relationships. Uh, so let me move to... So we, here we have a couple of very successful young children. Um, I love the look on this little boy's face who just painted his uh, family room with real paint uh, and himself and his complicit brother. Um, I just think that this, this captures this idea of autonomy, perhaps a little bit of lack of judgment, but uh, I just, you know, the, the joy in this child's face is, is what I want you to see. And you can probably experience uh, a little bit of what the parent experienced by looking at this. Um, language. This is from Dan Stern's uh, work. But the idea in toddlerhood, so you have children and parents coming to the library or in whatever setting you are and the parent and the child are actually relating to each other with language. I see this as um, 
a very difficult part. It's a very exciting part of growth and development in toddlerhood. The child, the advent of language ultimately brings about the ability to narrate one's own life story with all the potential that holds for changing how one views oneself. So I am a boy. I am a girl. I'm big. I'm whatever. Um, and I get to be now controlled by language. When I was a baby, my mother, when I cried, when I made a noise, my mother came and picked me up. I got into physical contact with her. That was me. Our relationship was very sensory motor. We were close to each other. Now, when I do something, she uses these strange sounds that come out of her mouth to control what I do. And I'm, I'm a big person now. I want to control what I do. So language is a very rich area for connection between parent and child and disconnection between parent and child. It's, um, it's, it's the currency of how um, children begin thinking about themselves as well. Damien, this is from Alicia Lieberman's book, The Emotional Life of the Toddler, which is probably one of the best books on toddlerhood. Damien is sitting at a table in his daycare center, slowly moving his jaw and mouth while staring into space. What are you chewing, Damien, asks his caregiver. I'm chewing mommy, replies Damien. So here's Damien. He's, you, he's, he's literally in between non-language and language. He's chewing his mother. His curriculum while away from his mother is how do I play with these other children? How do I use these materials? How do I relate to these other adults while mommy isn't here? While mommy isn't here. And when his caregiver asks him what he's chewing, he very physically keeps her with him. Um, this is the challenge. This is the challenge of toddlerhood. How can I be a functioning person in this complex world um, when everything I've learned about the world has come through this other relationship? Um, so we meet, need to support that relationship. We need to support the transitions between settings uh, by supporting the relationship. Here's another example of developmental disorganization and how a parent experiences it. Grace, 21 months old, had her first temper tantrum the other night. In the past, she's been very nurturant with her babies, her dolls, her stuffed animals, kissing and holding them. Well, the other night, she couldn't move one of her dolls the way she wanted to, and she began screaming and crying. She threw the doll on the floor and began jumping on it. Robert, the husband, got concerned. He asked, what should we do now? Basically, the same question that was asked at three weeks and four months and nine months. The child has changed. Something has changed, and the change is a result in the child's brain and the child's developmental capacities, and I don't know what to do. Um, I love this. I love temper tantrums. Um, a temper tantrum is an essential part of toddlerhood. Certainly there are some kids that don't exhibit them to the same degree as others. But this idea that, gee, the world is supposed to work a certain way. When I look at babies and human beings, their arms move. They can bend their arms. Why can't, now I have representational thought now. I'm playing with my doll. I want this doll's arm to move the way I know arms can move. I have an idea in my head and reality is different from that. It happens to adults as well. I have an idea about the way the world's supposed to work and then it doesn't work the way I want and I get upset. And in this case, however, she doesn't have the words, she doesn't have the representational thinking at, this point to really manage that disorganization. So she has a temper tantrum. And she's learning a tremendous amount from this temper tantrum. She's learning that her emotions don't solve this problem, uh, that the real world is different than the imaginary world. 
um, she's she's learning a lot of a lot of things in this process. So it's an essential part of development. Now, what we need to think about is what do the adults do in this situation? How do we hold the child, keep the child safe, and then at the next level, how do we hold the parent so that the parent who has a toddler who's prone to temper tantrums can manage this process, keep the child safe, and help the child understand that the world makes sense anyway? One more example, because toddlerhood is so rich for, for, for this notion that disorganization and development and the wrenches that children can throw at us that require a system to support the parent. One perfect spring day as I sat on my deck, I looked up from the book I was reading to see my daughter, then two and a half, nose to nose with the daffodils in our garden. Bending from one flower to another, she gave each of them a gentle kiss, swamped with love and pride that I had produced such a sweet and tender child. I rushed to sit beside her. That's when she calmly turned, looked me straight in the eye, and said, Go away. I don't want you here. I want Daddy. I was devastated. Ah, oh, I love this little story. This child is saying, let me... Um, summarize here. The child is saying, Mommy, you've been a, mother, a wonderful mother. Look at me. I love flowers. I kiss them. I'm a wonderful child. You've raised me so wonderfully that now I can step away from you. In fact, I kind of need to step away from you. It hurts. It hurts, doesn't it? Um, but And by the way, this man who shows up in the house occasionally, he seems to know something about that world out there that I need to know as well. So I want to spend some time with him. Of course, this is hurtful. And it may even, on the part of the two-and-a-half-year-old, be a purposeful uh, hurt to see what the mother does when she says this. Um, because we know that toddlers are now experimenting with emotions and not just experimenting with their own emotions, um, they're experimenting with the emotions of others to see what happens. It's part of the experiment. It's an exciting experiment. However, the vulnerable parent won't always see it as an exciting experiment in child development. Oh, I just read one of the chat items and it's making me laugh. Um, good luck with your 17 months old. It's a great age. Um, preschool. Okay, so now we've moved from infancy, this, this time of very sensory motor connection, a time of gaining self-regulation, a kind of time of gaining sense of self in relationship with another, to toddlerhood, where there are very powerful emotions. There's this in-between period of, of being very much grounded in the sensory motor world, but beginning to use ideas, beginning to regulate very powerful emotions, to now we're talking about three to five-year-old children. Three to five year old. I often will will do a a, a session on uh, emotional competence and the emotional the development of emotional competence from birth to five, and I ask people at the beginning of that to define or describe an emotionally competent adult, and they come up with a list of things, and then I ask them to des describe an emotionally competent five year old, and they basically come up with the very same list of things. Um, we expect a lot to happen in the first five years of life. Uh, so preschool competence, able to feel a full range of emotions, able to recognize emotions in self, able to label emotions in self, able to express and communicate feelings. Um, and these are all, you know, pretty complex things that take, take a lot of co-regulation to develop. Um, you know, in infancy, we begin to help the child recognize emotions when we smile when the child smiles. I do it in the supermarket all the time. And you do it probably, probably every time you walk by a baby in somebody's arms or in a carriage, that baby will look at your face 
and say, what is your face saying? So this, this process of recognizing emotions happens very early. And then labeling them with words in, um, in late infancy and toddlerhood, and then expecting the appropriate expression of emotions and communication. And then this final point, preschool competence, and this is one that I know uh, appeals to you as librarians, is engages in dramatic play. Dramatic play is the royal road for young children to deal with disorganization and development. Um, and if you uh, are familiar with the work of Vivian Paley. If you're not familiar with the work of Vivian Paley, you should be. Um, she, uh, she has an exquisite understanding of storytelling in young children. She, she basically created a curriculum when she was dissatisfied with her own curriculum at the University of Chicago. Uh, she created a curriculum in which she has, she literally takes down or takes down children's stories literally. She takes down exactly what they say and then has the children choose peers to act out their stories. Um, and she's, uh, she, she has a very, very exquisite understanding of how children are looking for intimacy in, in the preschool years. In any case, uh, she says, we were taught to say that play is a work of children, but watching and listening to them, I saw that play was nothing less than truth in life. Okay, so the play of young children can be disorganizing for adults. Children do all kinds of things in their play. They actually shoot at each other with guns. Um, they pretend they pretend to go to sleep a lot. Three-year-olds often, if you go to a child care program, you'll often see three-year-olds making pretend to go to sleep at night. And as an adult, you look at that and you say, what? This is the most boring play. All they do is go to sleep. In, but what are they truly doing? They are using their capacity for storytelling, their capacity for, for writing a script in their head, um, to make sense out of something that doesn't make sense. When they fall asleep at night, all kinds of ideas come into their heads. This is a very vulnerable point. So when they're at three-year-olds playing, going to sleep, they're making sense out of something. So if we can see children's play, not so much as let's constantly analyze the meaning they're making of the play, but rather as kind of the medium through which they make sense, then we, uh, we're we doing uh, them a great favor. And family's a great favor when um, when we acknowledge the importance of that play. Um, so this is what I just said. Uh, and in fact, um, there is some supporting research that says that, that demonstrates that play actually helps the brain uh, with things like planning and self-regulation. We know that those children that engage in, in very sophisticated dramatic play are better readers in third grade. We know that they have a higher level of uh, executive, executive function skills. Uh, executive function skills are skills that progress from what I was talking about earlier in infancy, the self-regulation, in toddlerhood, the self-regulation, the beginning to be able to organize oneself to do a job, uh, what we call frontal lobe functions, um, the, the the ability to, to, to know that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to, to your work, um, the ability to control your impulses, all these uh, capacities uh, develop through play. Okay, so what do we do? So I've talked uh, for probably a little too long about the developmental process and some of the major points that we would make from birth to five, but in the touch points approach we have eight principles and a number of assumptions that we apply to our work with kids and families. We do this training in three days, two days, um, perhaps more if we can. And so what we do is we uh, help 
practitioners, whether it's librarians or, or early childhood educators or pediatricians, develop the capacity to join parents in thinking about these developmental phenomena. So touch points isn't just about development. It's also about how we form relationships with families. So I've decided just to quickly focus on a couple of the principles here. Um, and one is focus on the parent-child relationship that the the initial premise of this this talk is uh, that development is nested in relationships and of course that the the most critical relationship is that between the parent and the child so our job as people joining the system as people are joining the system of care around the child is to to help strengthen that relationship now we can't do that easily from the outside but there are a lot of things that we can do we can notice how a child is looking at a parent when the the child comes into into our setting we can notice um let me give an example uh a teacher i was talking with recently said that he noticed that the four-year-old child was talking to herself when she was tying her shoes. Oh, wow, that's great. But instead of just saying something, oh, that's, that's great, you know, private speech is great for four-year-old development, the, the, the teacher asked the parents, like, what do you think she's saying? And what it turned out she was saying was exactly what the mother says when she ties the girl's shoes. So this child's developmental skill that's being demonstrated is simultaneously demonstrating the skill of the mother as a mother. Um, now here's our first picture of Dr. Braselton. So the second principle I want to bring up, and then we can uh, open it up for some questions, is support parental mastery. Now this one is very interesting. How do we do that? Now look at everybody's face here. Dr. Brazelton is looking at the mother. The mother is looking down. She's talking about something. And of course the child is listening very carefully. I think that Dr. Brazelton, and, and it's interesting to me that Dr. Brazelton isn't the one who's doing the talking. The mother is doing the talking. So somehow this notion of coming alongside a parent as they're trying to figure out how to parent, not necessarily giving advice, but joining the conversation because we don't have the answers within that parent's culture or that parent's personal history or even the knowledge of this unique child that the child um, is, is presenting that the parent has. So something is happening here where Dr. Brazelton is coming alongside the parent and they're talking about something quite important and it relates to this child. I'm confident of that. So how do we do that well? We do it well by knowing some of the development that we just talked about, by recognizing that parents actually seek these conversations. Um, so uh, these are two of the principles. Uh, focus on the parent-child relationship, support parental mastery. Um, the other ones are include things like use the behavior of the child as your language and value passion wherever it arises. Um, when a parent is angry, that often can be interpreted as that's love for the child and let's work with that anger rather than get defensive. So that was um, very quick on value passion, but I think we ought to open it up for questions at this point. And you do have a question, John, from Margaret. She was wanting to know more about okay. understanding different cultures. Okay. Uh, I think that, that it's always mixed cultures. Actually, I think that every disagreement, every kind of conflict between two people about what is right or wrong for a child is a cultural conflict. So I think it's what's important is to kind of be aware that there are very many legitimate styles and to be open to, to, to conversations about that. I think that this, this process of kind of becoming a cultural voyeur is not very effective. I think you should have multiple cultures you know, represented, but I think the, uh, the important part is, is kind of recognizing what you're bringing to the work. Um, and then recognizing that people will bring, and, and the question is very interesting in that different parenting styles will bring very strong feelings about what's right and wrong. And I think the perspective we have to take is 
that the brain is in fact the the universal brain is is in fact designed to require a culture and cultures have developed very different ways of raising children so we should avoid right and wrong uh and support what is right for this child in this family and in this environment of course that raises the whole issue of um, the immigrant and I'm an immigrant myself and and which pieces of this a family adopts and that's where we really have a wonderful opportunity to join a family is uh, when they they're making these choices what what's in, in inside of them is saying differently than what the society is telling them and how we can hold that conversation so that they can um, they can make their parenting decisions what did I say right before value passion? I might have said another principle, which was use the behavior of the child as your language. And what we find, um, what we find is that when the safest place to go when you want to develop a relationship with a parent and you want to help them with their parenting process is to simply narrate what you see in the child. It's kind of the golden road, you know, for um, for at least early childhood professionals because it's something we can both see, you know. If it's about culture, if it's like, oh, this is what I believe is right, and this is what you believe, that that can raise conflict. However, if it's you see what I see, tell me what you think about what you see. Um, the um, the perfect parenting style, no. Um, I, I am not aware of a perfect parenting style. There's a parenting style that's appropriate for this child in this family, in this culture. And it's a process of, of constructing that, that the parent has to engage in. That makes parenting very hard because if you're constructing it without any input, then you're inventing something that you don't have the data to invent. So that's why parents are also designed to have conversations about how to parent. Um, the lack of parenting skills question is a very difficult question. Yes, we know that um, over generations, um, and it may have been true historically as well, but over generations, families have lost kind of the prescriptions for parenting that they might have had a few generations ago. Um, and that that is precisely why um, touch points exist, I think that families uh, that may lack what we see as appropriate parenting skills, that the, the nice thing about all of this is that they are designed to take input on parenting. They're designed as human beings to construct their own parenting. Um, we, do, um, we do a lot of work through touch points with very stressed families, with families who um, have abused their children and um, and have you know under under many different kind of stresses, and the same kind of principles hold though that 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 parent is the parent of the child, and that parent is available for a conversation about how to get good at understanding their um, their child. So John, I'm going to interject. This is Suzanne. We're almost to yeah. the top of the hour, um, and I really want to thank you. Lots of questions are starting to come, though, and I think it's because you've, you've given us this really nice foundation of concepts to be thinking about. And the good news that I want to make sure that everyone knows is that we are, the California State Library will be officially entering into a partnership with the Touchpoint Center and working with faculty members like John and others over the coming year to actually develop a library-specific training curriculum where these very kinds of questions and vignettes about, so how would this look in a library setting, or what do we do when you know parents are coming up to us and their child is going, and they are going through this period of disorganization in their parenting. And so there's the, the good news is there's lots more we can be talking about this, um, and we're working toward um, developing some more tools to support all of you as we all look at ways in which we can begin to sort of grapple with these concepts and put some of these ideas into practice. So I wanted to thank you, John, for sort of laying the foundation and introducing us to some of the basic touch points concepts.
I felt like I was sliding around on the tip of an iceberg. Um, you're, do, you're doing great. So we're, still, we're still, we're still, yeah. <laughs> There's so much. So I'm, I'm so pleased that you're going to do more work with touch points. Um, I do want to very quickly respond to this question of the four-year-old in story time who listens to me but does not listen to mommy. Mommy wonders if it's normal. Is it? I think so. I think so. I think four-year-olds, as that, that two-and-a-half-year-old quote demonstrated, four-year-olds are ready to, to, to reach out and listen to other people. It may be hurtful for the mommy a little bit. Um, but yes. Uh, somebody else to listen to at four sounds very appropriate. Thanks, John. I'm so I didn't even see that question. I'm glad you were able to squeeze it in. Yeah, yeah. Well, any more? Really? We got like thirty seconds left. Yeah, we have got thirty seconds left. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you know. Thank you very much for uh, listening to this monologue.